Hi friends, today we're going to be going over a case study similar to one you may see when taking your NCLEX Next Generation exam. Let's get started. When first looking at our case study, we can see there's a screen with a few tabs on it, nurses notes, vitals, and assessment. During your exam, you will be able to click through each of those tabs. For today's example, we will review each tab on its own slide. Let's start with the first tab. The first thing we notice is that the nurse is caring for a 25 year old female client in a postpartum care unit. Now let's review the nurse's note. At 17.45, the nurse noted the client, Mrs. N, is a G2P2 female who delivered a healthy female infant vaginally 12 hours ago. What does the information G2P2 tell us about this client? G stands for gravita, or how many times someone has been pregnant, and P stands for para, or how many living children someone has. So we know this client has been pregnant twice and has two living children. Okay, let's move on. She had an uneventful pregnancy, has no known allergies, no significant medical history, bleeding, or coagulation disorders. She underwent routine prenatal care, labor was a total of four hours, and a vacuum-assisted delivery was required. Antenatal labs were within normal limits. Mrs. N experienced a laceration during delivery that required two sutures. The client now reports feeling dizzy and lightheaded. When looking over a case study, we always want to pull out any information that may give us clues into the client condition and possible complications. Some things I would hone down on are that she had a vacuum assisted delivery and she has a laceration. Both of those items can increase potential risks in the postpartum period. All right, let's move on to the vitals tab. Take a second, pause the video, look over the vital signs. Ooh, I don't love that heart rate and blood pressure. What do you think? Now that you've had a chance to review the vital signs, we can begin to create a mental picture of our client. Let's move on to the nurse's assessment where we will really start to gather a complete picture of our client. The nurse's note states that the client appears pale and diaphoretic. The client reports mild shortness of breath. The client's fundus is boggy and deviated to the right. No abnormal heart rhythms or murmurs noted. Bright red vaginal bleeding, estimated to be approximately 600 mLs, is found on the client's pad. The client reports feeling significant wetness between their legs beginning roughly an hour ago. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, what stands out? Is the amount of blood loss normal? What's going on with our fundus? Does it seem like a normal post-delivery? So take a second and think about what stands out to set us up for our first question. Now let's look at our first question associated with this case study. Which of the following assessment findings requires immediate follow-up? Select all that apply. Take a moment to pause this video, review the questions, and determine which answer choices you think best apply. When you're ready to continue, click play and we'll review the answers together. Okay. Now that you've had a chance to review, let's look at the correct and incorrect answers. Answer choice number one, blood loss of approximately 600 mLs. This answer choice is correct. Blood loss of approximately 600 mLs is concerning and requires immediate attention to prevent further complications. This is a large amount of blood loss post-vaginal delivery. Over 500 mLs for vaginal delivery is abnormal. Number two, blood pressure of 88 over 60. This blood pressure is hypotensive and is an indicator of hypovolemia potentially related to blood loss. Number three, a pulse of 130 beats per minute. This is elevated and possible causes should be assessed. Tachycardia in this scenario could be a compensatory response to hypovolemia due to blood loss, which indicates hemodynamic instability. Number four, the fundus is boggy. This suggests uterine atony, which means the uterus has not contracted back down as it should after delivery. This can lead to postpartum hemorrhage. This is a super important indicator for us as nurses to recognize and respond to. Number five, pale and diaphoretic appearance. This indicates further suspicion of postpartum hemorrhage. And last, a respiratory rate of 24. This is an incorrect answer choice. A respiratory rate of 24 is a mildly elevated finding and would not indicate immediate follow-up. Let's move on to question two. This is a chart that's similar to one you may find on your exam. For each finding listed, you will mark to specify whether the finding is consistent with postpartum hemorrhage, infection, or preeclampsia. Take a moment to pause, make your selections, and then we will review the correct and incorrect answer choices. Okay, now that you've had a moment to make your choices, let's review. Let's go through these one by one. First, 600 amounts of blood loss. We see that with what condition? Postpartum hemorrhage, good. 
headache. If you said preeclampsia, you would be correct. Why would a patient with preeclampsia have a headache? Think preeclampsia, hypertension, hypertension can cause headache, so now preeclampsia makes sense. Tachycardia, we can see with which conditions? All three. Why? The heart rate can rise when the body is stressed, which it would be with postpartum hemorrhage, infection, or preeclampsia. A boggy fundus. You've got it if you said postpartum hemorrhage. This is when the uterus is enlarged, soft, and typically contains a significant amount of blood, which is exactly what we see with postpartum hemorrhage. Last, shortness of breath. What conditions do you think we might see this with? Postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia. Correct. Let's move on to question three. Similarly to the last chart, you will select to specify whether the following potential orders would be indicated or not indicated for this client. Take a moment to pause the video, make your choice, and then we will review. Okay, looking at this chart, let's review which potential orders are indicated or not indicated for our client. Administration of IV fluids and oxytocin. Indicated. Correct. We definitely want to get oxytocin on board because we know that will help the uterus contract down, which will aid in stopping the hemorrhage. Ambulate client. If you said not indicated, you're correct. While ambulation is important, that was not an appropriate time for that. All right, next one. Apply pressure and massage the fundus. Definitely indicated. Again, this will help the uterus contract down, stopping the hemorrhage. Continuously monitor for hypovolemic shock. Indicated. Correct. This client is at high risk for hypovolemic shock, so we want to monitor closely for that. Okay, last one. Delay fluid restriction for 20 minutes. Not indicated. There is no reason to delay care to this client. Their needs are urgent, and we should get fluid resuscitation started as quickly as possible. Let's move on to question four. Which of the following interventions should the nurse initiate first? One, administer blood products and oxytocin. Two, administer fundal massage and activate the emergency response team. Three, measure and document the amount of blood loss and provide the client with a new pad. Four, place an IV in the client for expected use. Take a moment to pause the video, make your selection, then press play when you're ready to discuss the answer choices. Now that you've had a moment to think about the choices, let's review each option, starting with option one. The nurse should anticipate administering blood products and oxytocin, but there may be better first interventions, so let's keep reading. Number two, potential good choice as activating the emergency response team would provide immediate response to the client, but let's keep reading before we decide. Number three, measure and document the amount of blood loss and provide the client with a new pad. What do we think? We always need to document and provide hygiene supplies to our client. However, is this the priority? Number four, place an IV in the client for expected use. An IV is always handy, but do we need it right away? After reviewing all answer choices, the first intervention by the nurse should be fundal massage while also activating the emergency response team per hospital protocol. Fundal massage is essential for clients experiencing postpartum hemorrhage. Fundal massage involves using one hand on the upper side of the uterus, cupping the fundus. The lower hand is above the symphysis pubis and supports the uterus while it is massaged gently by the upper hand. Fundal massage helps restore uterine muscle tone and alleviate uterine acne. It should be completed until the fundus feels firm. Looking back at the other answer choices, we can see that the nurse should anticipate administering blood products and oxytocin, but there are better first interventions. These would need to be ordered by the primary healthcare provider before administration and after initiating the emergency response team. The amount of blood loss does need to be measured and documented, but that can be delegated to another nurse after the fundal massage and the emergency response team has been activated. NIV should be placed, but it is not the priority intervention at this time. Question five, complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options. The client is at highest risk for developing one, chorioamnionitis, two, disseminated intravascular coagulation, three, hypertensive crisis, or four, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Take a moment to pause the video, review the answer choices, and make your selection. When you're finished, press play, and we will review. Okay, looking at this question, the client is at highest risk for developing disseminated intravascular coagulation. That's right. This client is at highest risk for developing this as a result of severe postpartum hemorrhage. DIC is caused by a disruption in the body's ability to clot normally. This is a life-threatening condition and represents a severe complication to postpartum hemorrhage. Let's review why the other answer choices are incorrect. First, 
chorioamnionitis. This is an infection of the placenta and the amniotic fluid. The infection is commonly associated with prolonged labor or premature rupture of membranes, neither of which were reported with this client's labor. Second, hypertensive crisis. This would not be anticipated in this client as they're already experiencing hypotension. We wouldn't anticipate the client to go from a hypotensive state to a hypertensive crisis. It would also be unusual to see a client with hypertensive crisis while experiencing a postpartum hemorrhage. The hemorrhage would cause the client to be hypotensive. And three, TTP. This is a rare disorder characterized by abnormal blood clotting. This is not a typical complication of postpartum hemorrhage. Now let's review another nurse's note. 1800, the emergency response team was activated and the client received a fundal massage. Upon arrival, the primary healthcare provider assessed the client and ordered an IV infusion of LR 150 mLs per minute for fluid resuscitation. IV was placed and fluid resuscitation was initiated. Vital signs at 1800 were a temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, a pulse of 80, respiratory rate of 20, blood pressure of 100 over 70, oxygen saturation of 94% on room air. Assessment. The client reports no shortness of breath. Blood pressure is responding appropriately with trends upward, now 100 over 70. The fundal tone is improving, palpated at the umbilicus. Vaginal bleeding is slowing, estimated at approximately 100 mLs over the last 30 minutes. The client appears mildly pale and reports some remaining dizziness. I will continue to monitor. Now let's move on to question 6. For each of the data collection findings, click to specify whether the findings indicate that the client's status is unchanged or improved. At this point, you're a pro with these charts, so I'm sure you know what to do. Go ahead and pause the video, make your selections, and we'll review afterwards. Okay, time to review. Let's go through each data collection finding. First, blood pressure is now 100 over 70 and was previously 88 over 60, so that has improved. Dizziness is unchanged because according to the nurse's note, the client still reports some remaining dizziness. Bleeding. This has improved as it is noted that the bleeding has slowed over the course of the last half hour. Last, shortness of breath. The client is reporting no shortness of breath, so this is also improved. And that's all for our case study today. Thank you so much for completing this with me and I'll see you next time.